All right. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Why not? Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, for those who were here a couple of weeks ago, you know my name. For those who are here today for the first time, I'm Nelson Chipman, an associate uh, professor uh, in the Cinema Arts Department here at Point Park, and welcome to you guys, and thank you so much for coming out, and thank you for those. And uh, again, thank you for those who are watching online via our live stream, and again, we uh, have uh, questions that can come in via Twitter, as long as you uh, place uh, or tweet hashtag making the chair. All right, so today, for those who were here a couple of weeks ago, what we have today is essentially a sequel uh, from our presentation. Now, as you know, sometimes sequels can you know, go south, like the story's not as good, box office isn't as strong, and you lose some of the stars. All right, so we've lost both of our stars for today. All right, so Chris Moore is not presenting, and Corey Musa is not presenting as well. However, we have a very strong story on the creative side of filmmaking, and we've recast with what I believe is an unbeatable duo. So with that, let me first introduce a uh, producer with Before the Door Productions uh, and CMU grad, Neil Dotson. All right, come on up, Neil. and a terrific multi-hyphenate, as well as hometown hero, who really needs no introduction. With that, I would like to introduce Zachary Quinto. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. Yeah, there we go. Um, so uh, we are here to talk about the creative side of filmmaking, but we can obviously let the conversation wander. Um, so Zach and I, and our third partner, Corey, who you met if you were here last week, and who's here as well, um, met, well, Cor Zach and I met in Erie, Pennsylvania in 1994, and then ended up at college together along with Corey at Carnegie Mellon. Um, but Zach grew, lived in Pittsburgh, obviously, for his first 22 years of life. Um, and uh, then we started a company about five and a half years ago, coming up on six this summer, um, and have been making uh, movies and comic books and some tiptoes into TV as well. And now we're here to talk about the chair and the creative sides of making movies. Do you want to uh, chat about how we became producers? Sure. Um, you know, it was, the, the year was 2008, and, uh, no, it was 2007 when we first started talking about it, so Neil and I have known each other for, um, a long time, and I was in L.A. and working more and more as an actor and feeling more and more like I had an opportunity that I should probably take advantage of before it maybe disappeared or maybe not, but I wanted to get in there while the window was open, so I knew that starting a company was a way to do that. I didn't really know much more than that, um, and then I, I started to consider how I, what, what would I do, and I knew that I needed somebody to do it with, that I couldn't, there was no way that I would be able to take the responsibility on myself. Um, and Neil was the only person in my life at the time um, that, that came to mind and, and really uh, made sense. So I approached Neil about it, um, and then we started talking about it, and before long, Corey moved to Los Angeles, and we brought him into the conversations, and then we spent about three or four months at least sort of talking about what it meant to start a company because pretty much all of us had only come from the creative side um, of things from the beginning. In other words, we, we were all actors first. We all went to Carnegie Mellon for, the, for acting. And uh, Neil, had, Neil and Corey both had segued out of acting primarily and into other things. And Neil was working for a producer at the time in Los Angeles. And uh, so you did, you did have a little bit more of an understanding of the crossover, but not much. I yeah, mean. I was working for a, a producer who had a deal at Warner Brothers at, the, at a studio um, who was making you know, mid to low level studio fare, but had a big deal there, and we had an office. I had a you know, parking space with my name on it, which was 
really excited doesn't have for my now. mom. Um, <laughs> and then, um, but I had sort of learned a little bit about how the studio side of things worked and decided that we wanted to try the independent side because I frankly didn't particularly care for the studio side of it. Um, it was a little too lack of, you know, it was less control, obviously more money, but less control over the, the creative process uh, primarily, which was something that, you know, bugged me because I'd come from the theater and from uh, an experience from which the director or the, the people involved in making the art, as it were, um, had all the control. Um, and I think the more money you spend, the less that is true, generally, unless you become someone like, you know, J.J. Abrams or James Cameron or one of these guys who can insist on that even though they're spending $200 million. But, um, so for me, the idea of making independent films, which I didn't know a whole heck of a lot about, was um, the most exciting way for us to go about it. And at the time, Zach, uh, Star Trek was happening and Heroes had happened for Zach, which gave us access, in essence. And that was really what sort of your exposure gave us, was access to some people it allowed us to get in some rooms. They didn't particularly take us that seriously when we started talking to them at first, but we sort of worked on our ability to tell them how we were gonna be responsible with their money and or make really cool shit. Um, and um, it took us a little while to figure out what the cool shit was gonna be um, at our company, but then it, again, it stemmed from the creative side. Um, you can come up with a business plan, which we had. We didn't follow it. <laughs> I think the first year for us was really about learning what it means to be a producer really. I mean, what does a producer do? Um, that was a question that we all had to answer as a company and as individuals, you know. I had been on enough sets to know when a producer's around, um, but I didn't necessarily understand what it meant to be one. So the first year we spent time um, bandying about a lot of ideas. There was a lot of brainstorming the first year. We were, at the time, trying to figure out how to involve ourselves a little bit um, on, in, in online, uh, perhaps branded narrative, branded storytelling, or, um, you know, we thought maybe that was some, at the time, like six years ago, that was just starting to emerge. People still weren't exactly sure how they were going to navigate those waters, so we thought maybe that would be a place to start, and got a few ideas halfway off the ground before they didn't really go anywhere, and, you know, we were always in pursuit of our first feature. We were always in pursuit of what will be the movie that we get behind, and, we cut our teeth on a couple of short films and projects that we did for ourselves to understand how to organize a day and how to schedule things and how to make sure that you make your, your, your shots and you get everything done you need to do. But um, Margin Call was our first feature film and that was a script that came to us through mutual friends of Neil and uh, the writer-director J.C. Chandor. And, um, and, and then it became really galvanizing. That was a, a really galvanizing moment for us when we each read that script and realized that this was something that resonated for all of us creatively and that we felt strongly we could bring to um, life. And, and that's when we really learned what I think it means to be producers. But and it I was from a creative... Yeah, and I think one of the things that, that worked for us about making that movie, and it was, a lot of it was ignorance, um, but in a good way. Like, I think we were kind of ignorant as to what we were supposed to be doing, so we just did what felt right. Um, it turned out that it, the movie turned out great, but it was also an experience where we knew that we wanted to support the director's vision um, of his movie. Uh, we wanted to make sure that he was able to direct it and we didn't have to give the script away to someone else to direct. We wanted to make sure that we got to cast the actors that we thought were really perfect and right for the roles instead of be forced to cast someone that we didn't think was right. Um, that started with Zach attaching himself to Star, which was another way in which we gave the project a little bit of life, was saying Zach is going to play this role in the movie and who else would like to be in it with him. Um, you know, but throughout the whole thing, sort of without almost knowing it, we managed to give our director for his first movie, and we didn't even know if he could direct, but we had a gut instinct that he could, but we hadn't frankly seen him direct anything that was worth betting a couple million bucks on, um, but we got someone to do that. Um, and we then, we obviously learned a lot about the business side, and I know that was largely what Chris and Corey talked about last week, um, which is we basically figured out a way to get someone to trust handing over a couple million dollars to a bunch of guys who had never done it before um, on a piece of material from a guy who'd never written anything before or directed anything before um, with only a couple of the roles cast, and it was only Zach's second movie, um, ultimately after Star Trek. Um, right. But that was a lot of just uh, smoke and mirrors, really. Yeah, I mean, you know, and then it became, it really, Neil said it, I mean, it was really a lot about instinct at that point. You know, we, we have, we, we spent a lot of time in those three or four months where we were figuring out what we wanted our company to be in the abstract, talking about um, 
ideas of integrity and, and how we can be respectful and how we can uh, you know, incentivize people to do their best work. Um, that's something I definitely learned from JJ and watching him in his process and, and looking at the company that he built, Bad Robot, um, and, uh, and, and, and a, a value that I really, that resonated for me in a lot of ways. So that's really where we started, you know, uh, and, and we were lucky to align ourselves with like-minded people, which I think is a huge part of the um, process, as esoteric as that sounds, you know, it's, uh, you do get back what you put out, and I think to a certain extent, when we, I remember when we were putting that movie together, and we were having such an incredible experience of it, first the cast shaped up in this remarkable way with actors like Kevin Spacey and Jeremy Irons, and, um, and then, you know, the process of bringing those people in, and working with them was so easy, and, um, and I remember talking about it with, with people who were in the business and who had maybe been producers for longer than we had, who would say things like, you know, this never happens, this will never happen this way again, and on one hand, my reaction is kind of, well, why not, you know, actually, if, if you approach the work from a certain perspective, then the work will evolve in a certain way, and, uh, and that was something that was proven to me, not only on Margin Call, but subsequently on the movies we've made since then, and, uh, and I think it's something that, by and large, can be regulated or, you know, you can have some control over uh, if, if, you, if it's important to you, if that's an aspect of it that, that resonates for you as yeah, well. Yeah, and we're shooting our fifth movie just before the door, in addition to the, the projects with the chair, and thus far we have not, we, every single director we've worked with has had final cut on their movies, and has basically gotten to cast who they wanted to cast, and gotten to make their movies the way that they wanted to make them, uh, you know, within the confines of whatever the price point of the movie was, um, which is something that we're really extremely proud of. There may be a day when we don't hold that um, to the limit because we want to spend a little more money than we have. Our for, margin call was made for about 3.4 million bucks. Um, it started, we tried to make it for about a million bucks, and as the cast improved, um, we were sort of allowed to expand the price point of that until it got to this place. Um, and then we made a movie uh, called Breakup at a Wedding, which we made for um, a little under half a million bucks, um, which we distributed through oscilloscope. And then we made um, that Corey led charge on a, a horror movie called The Banshee Chapter, which um, is out on DVD and VOD now. Um, and um, we made that for uh, under a million bucks, but somewhere between half a million and a million bucks. Um, and then we made the Robert Redford movie that um, we're fortunate enough to be nominated for uh, four Independent Spirit Awards for um, on March 1st. Um, we did not win a BAFTA last night, guys. I know. It's sad. No, our sound team was nominated for a BAFTA. Um, and then we were, we were nominated for an Oscar um, as well for sound on that movie. Um, so on the first and second, we'll see how those turn out. That was about a $9 million movie. Um, and now we're making one in New York right now that I was on a shutdown highway in upstate New York last night till about one o'clock in the morning um, called A Most Violent Year, which is also with JC who directed Margin Call and All Is Lost, um, which is about a $21 million movie. Um, it's a, certainly as big in scale and scope as we've gone, but, um, and then we've got the chair projects, um, which are very exciting and we're excited to be here and hope that you guys are excited about them being here. Um, what else do you have to say, Zachary? Mm, I mean, I feel like, uh, why don't, I mean, how many people here are in the film school? So most all of you. And, and does the film school here comprise of different disciplines? In other words, you can be a directing student, you can be an acting student, you can be a, yeah. cool. Yeah. So, um, you know, it may be helpful for us to hear from you guys and if there's any questions that you have that might steer the conversation, we're happy to open up to them and, uh, and, and respond that way. It seems like rather, I mean, I don't know what you want to hear, so that seems like a yeah, better way Yeah, tell us what you want to hear and we'll tell you that. How about it? You can probably, well, all right. I mean, the mic. Yeah. Good. yeah. Go for it, man. Green shirt, it's time. Yeah, um, by the way, just saying congratulations to you guys on All Is Lost, hell of a film, you guys did an amazing Thanks. job with that. Um, what's it like to go from something like Margin Call to All Is Lost, just something as producers that's radically different, or to go from like something that's All Is Lost to the Banshee chapters? Yeah, I mean, obviously there, it's, it starts with figuring out what the director needs and what he wants, and obviously, you know, it, it's, sometimes it's super logistic, right? So Margin Call needed an office. It needed nine really good actors, and it needed some computers that looked like they had financial data running all over them, and that was sort of the base of it, and we need some cameras to shoot it with, right? 
So figuring out how much all that stuff costs is the beginning of how you start producing it from a financial and logistics side. And from a creative side, it involved hiring a casting director and having them help us figure out who those actors were gonna be. And, and frankly, in the case of Margin Call, we didn't know any better and still kind of follow the same idea, yeah. which is it's a lot of it is just our own taste and our director's taste, and we do it a lot in kind of like a, you know, a little, like a brainstorm, like a little sort of hive and figure out, you know, who do, you, who do we think is gonna be the best guy whose dog died who is really sad because the financial crash is happening. Like, Kevin Spacey sounds great to me. Let, I don't know, let, Zach has met him five or six times and knows him a little bit. So Zach will put in a phone call and Kevin says, great, I'll read the script. And suddenly people are like, I don't know how the hell you got Kevin Spacey to read that script. And the answer is, we asked, you know. Um, the same was true for the uh, Redford movie, which is um, after, or it was while Margin Call was going on, it was actually while we were at Sundance that JC sort of had the idea that maybe it could be Robert Redford. He was starting to write this sort of lonely man in a boat movie. Um, and then we were at Berlin together um, with Margin Call. And we sort of pitched it to a foreign sales guy and said, what do you think about Robert Redford in a boat? And it's sort of, this is kind of what happens. And nobody's going to talk very much. And, and, and he said, well, as long as you make it for under like 12 million bucks, maybe under 10 is better. Um, that could be really great. I'll help, you, I'll help you put that together. So JC sent the script to Robert Redford. Um, and Robert Redford said yes, and when he said yes, he said to JC, you know, you're the only filmmaker that's ever come through the Sundance Film Festival who's ever asked me to be in their movie. And so the reason why Robert Redford's in that movie is, is because, because, what'd you say? Partially because is Certainly partially because we asked, you know. Um, people like to do good work. If you're doing brave work, it makes it harder to pay for, but it makes it, in my experience, in our experience, easier to get, um, creatives involved. Not to oversimplify that. I mean, I, I, no, no, it's, right, it's more complicated you know, but than that. But it does <laughs> circle back around a little bit to the access point, which is that, you know, I did have exposure and that's one of the ways in which I can be really helpful to my company. You know, I didn't start this company to be a vanity plate for myself. I didn't start this company so that I could be in every movie that we make. Um, and you've only been to in date, one? the only one I've been in is Margin Call, you know, but but one of the value, one of one of the valuable uh, contributions that I can make specifically is that I have a lot of direct contacts that, you know, the company wouldn't otherwise have. Um, so, so just, you know, that that is part of it, is that it's not just anybody calling up Kevin, or it's not just any director calling up uh, Bob, it's, it's someone who did have that exposure, JC, or it is someone that has that connection to me. So, so that's a little bit, you know, as you're considering how to build stuff and how to get material to actors, it's something to consider is what, what connections can you possibly generate for yourself as a filmmaker to those people, either personal or professional. Um, and, Thanks for and bringing the, making it all sound impossible now. I'm not making it sound impossible. <laughs> sound really cool. We get along so well, really. Yeah. Best friends, best Thanks, friends. Thanks, guys. Please. Yeah, sure. Resounding silence. Okay, well. No, Zach and Neil, this is Nelson in the back. What? I, this is Nelson from in the back. Oh, hi, Nelson. Yeah, I forgot to tell you, you have some waters off to the side near the podium. He's, <laughs> so you might want to get those. <laughs> you got it. I'm kidding. I figured. Thank you, Nelson. <laughs> Who else? We're in a room full of filmmakers. We made some weird little movies. Yes, sir. Hey, so I'm a directing concentration, and this is uh, towards Zach. So, J.J. Uh, Abrams is one of the greatest new directors out there. Um, what do you think really separates him from all the other directors? What sets him one step above everybody else hmm. <clears throat> as an actor that's been directed by him? I think J.J.'s awareness that though he is the, the final voice, the preeminent voice on set, um, he's nothing without the people around him. Uh, I think it's a philosophy that he adopts on every level of, uh, of, of the process of directing. So, so he's, like any good general, really takes the counsel of all of the people that are surrounding him to, to, uh, to make decisions. And I think that goes for his actors as well. I think he recognizes what we bring to the equation. Any film, as anybody in this room knows, is um, it's the sum of a lot of parts, and uh, there are so many people that have to contribute. And, and I always feel like on a film set, as an actor, I am just one of many voices, no matter how big a role I'm playing or how big the budget on the film is. 
you know, my contribution is significant, uh, but it's not, uh, it, it's not the only one that, uh, that matters. You know, it's, it's, it's one of many. And I think JJ really uh, approaches things that way. And, and he just creates a very, very comfortable, easy environment to work in. Uh, as I mentioned before, that idea of incentivizing everybody to do the best work that they can do, um, giving people a reason to want the project itself to succeed, um, and, and choosing the best people for the job, whether they be actors or you know, production designers or, or you know, sound people, whatever it is, it's, uh, it's a big part of it. And, yeah, I mean, I just remember my very first day on the first Star Trek movie. Star Trek was my first film. Um, and that's a pretty enormous trial by fire. And I remember him creating an environment that was very conducive to me doing the work that I needed to do and making it quiet and, and taking all of the added elements of distraction or pressure out of the equation for me and just being considerate and being aware and in tune and sensitive to the fact that it was the first time that I had ever done this on this level and to this degree, um, and that was enormously helpful. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Cheers. Um, I have another question. If yeah, do else. it. Um, okay. The mic's so, here until someone takes it. <laughs> that's fine. Um, so you've worked on both TV and feature films. Can you just um, go over like the differences between the two when acting in a role like that? Sure. Um, a film is more contained. In other words, you know the beginning, the middle, the end of the story. Generally, you have uh, a longer amount of time to tell that story, although in the case of Margin Call, which we shot in 17 days, not that much longer than you have to shoot an episode of television, but a week longer. Um, and, uh, and television is relentless. It's relentlessly paced. And you don't always know where your character is going, and you don't always have all the information that informs the storyline in episode 13 when you're shooting episode four. Um, you know, so, so there's, a, there's a, a sustenance that's required, uh, if that's the appropriate use of that word. I think so. Sustaining, there's I'll a sustaining it, nature. I don't think you should, I think that's actually a misuse. Pull that one out. There's a sustaining, there's a sustaining quality that's required of your work as an actor on a television series, which, you have to be able to, um, you have to be able to really use your instincts and be in touch with your instincts in a way that, in film you can really craft a character and a performance because you know what it is. And in television I think there has to be a fluidity and a flexibility that allows for whatever corner the writers might need to paint themselves out of down the line, which happens, and especially on the kinds of television shows that I've worked on, you know, which reverse on themselves and turn back around and you know, sometimes to a fault, uh, don't know where they're going. I think instead of sustenance, you can go with sustained. Sustained. No. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thanks, Ken. Great work, by the way. <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. I am a freshman cinema major, and I have freshman what major? Cinema. 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 And cinema. being as cinema. This is a room full of cinema majors, I think we can all agree. Part of the biggest fear for us is finding a job after college. So being as you two own your own production company, what do you generally look for for applications and applicants who would like to come work for you? When we have the resources to hire, we, we haven't really grown. Well, too. Yeah, well, no. Him, I mean, on a, on a, on a film, like uh, on an individual film basis, you know, we're, we're always looking for ways to invite young, young people in. And, you know, we, we've worked almost exclusively, except for the directors that we've made their second and now third films with, all of our directors are first-time feature directors. So, you know, part of the ethos of our company is to uh, provide opportunities for people who haven't had opportunities yet. Um, but, but, but the hiring that we do is mostly on a, on a specific project-to-project -project basis and for specific um, jobs within a production. So then we would look for the qualifications that that job asks for, pretty much. We haven't grown the infrastructure of our company beyond um, you know, a handful of people that have worked with us pretty well from the beginning. Um, you know, and that's something that we want to do, and then depending on the position we need to fill, we, we would look at the criteria of what that position. So it's really about, I mean, look, you're in the right place. You're in, you're in a professional training program for, you know, working as a professional in the real world, obviously at a university that's interested in, in bridging that distance for you before you graduate. So it's a great place to be, clearly. Um, 
and, and I think that combined with experience and, and doing as much as you can as interns or you know PAs or being on set you know on set experience because you'll learn more on set for 10 minutes than you could learn from us sitting here talking to you for three hours. I mean, it's just... As fascinating as we are. <laughs> observation, you know, um, absorption. Those are the things, experience, immersion. Those are the things that are important, and those are the things that we would look for. I mean, we'd rather have somebody come on to a project that's been on three sets of, you know, different student films that they directed or that they edited or that they did, you know, some significant contribution for rather than somebody that's just coming out of a program. So outside of school, as much as you can get your hands on experience, I feel like that's going to benefit you in the long run. And the, for someone like me who before starting the company, I went and worked for someone, you know, that was a moment in my, you know, I was, I was an actor at the time and I basically called my agent, I was doing a play and I called my agent and was like, I want to get a job in development or production or something like this. And they were like, do you want to work at an agency? And I thought about that. And, and for me, that wasn't the right job. Uh, but for some people it is, and it's a great path, and I'd be making a lot more money now than I am um, if I had decided on that path. So if money's the goal, there are different choices. Um, but for me, I knew I wanted to be where someone was either making or at least trying to make movies. So I didn't really want to be in the studio, uh, like in the studio's infrastructure, but for a producer. So then that narrowed it down. And I basically just told everybody, including Zach, who was no help at all, um, <laughs> that I wanted to find a producer to go work for or learn from, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I found an entry-level job and was making, you know, very little money, but enough to pay my rent on and show up every day and soak it up. And at night, I was reading scripts and developing projects of my own and going off and shooting short films and doing all this other stuff, which then I would come in and talk to my boss about. And he wasn't particularly interested in hearing about them most of the time, but I did it anyway, you know. And it was part of the building of my experience. And, Thinking back on it, the projects that I was, the feature films and scripts that I was trying to develop at the time and thought I would go make an amazing movie out of, now looking at them, you know, they were not very good and they weren't ready to be made into movies, but it was a huge part of my process of getting to the place where when we were finally faced with a piece of material, it felt like we sort of looked at each other and a handful of other smart people and said, this is as good as I think it is, right? We sort of had done enough of the other processes to kind of know just barely enough what to do with it. So I think Zach's absolutely right. It's just about doing as much as you can and you know, um, working as hard as you can and getting to know as many people as you can. And the people in this room that you're here with right now are gonna be an enormous resource in Corey and Zach and myself. And two of the movies that we've produced have been directed by people we went to college with, et cetera, are a great example of that. They look to your left, look to your right, and that person's gonna be um, a help to you someday because they're gonna be, there you go. Either it. hiring you Play or, along they, or asking Just for a job. Pretend like you're looking to. But seriously, they, they, they'll either hire you or you'll hire them, or they'll say, oh, you know what, I have a friend who made this amazing short film about that subject when we were at school, and they would be great to work on your project, and, and that's where it'll come from. So maintaining your sort of network of, of colleagues is important. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, good luck. Hey. <laughs> what? That did sound dark. Really? No, like, no. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> I meant it legit, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, first off, I'd like to thank you for uh, coming out and doing this. I'm sure we all appreciate it. Um, oh. Since this is a conversation about the creative side of filmmaking, what is the, um, the biggest mistake you guys have made in your careers, and how did you handle it, and what did you learn from it? Hmm. Zach's gonna th deep think about this one. Well, no, I, it's just interesting. I, 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 don't, I don't, if you're talking about creativity, Ultimately, mistakes aren't prohibitive. I mean, I, I don't really think that I've made any mistakes in my career that have, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I feel like I, what, you have an idea? No, I don't. Yeah. Would it be amazing? I was like, come on, Zach. Let's, let's <laughs> finally admit that today. That well, was a But mistake. the interesting thing is, for a long time, my only goal was to work. You know, I mean, my only concern was getting a job for years. When Zach LA. got Heroes, Zach was really fucking broke. Yeah, like I, really broke, and not, and less le, less. And he'd worked a lot, and you were broke. It was less about being broke, actually, but more about being broken. I felt like at the time I was really, I just hadn't worked in a long time. I hadn't worked in like six months, and I really felt like I was at a point where if I could have imagined myself doing anything else, I probably would have. I just couldn't have come up with it, you know. And and that audition came for me at a time when I think I was in a place naturally. Um, 
that was relatively dark and, and it lent itself to me being able to connect with that character in a way that allowed me to get that job. But, you know, but to, to be serious about that point, I think it's, you know, as long as you learn from mistakes that you make, you know, I, I've made mistakes sometimes, I would say, I would say the biggest mistakes that I've made probably have to do with reading other people, right? Like I should have trusted my instincts more. I should have made different decisions on a case-by-case -case basis about who to involve myself with or who to trust. You know, trust and instinct are two incredibly important factors in the creative process in general, but also when you're applying the creative process to trying to cultivate a, a career and a, the, the, the line between creative and business, which is an inevitable line that all of us trod. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that would be it, but, but, but I learned from it. I never made that mistake again. So, so as long as you are able to integrate the mistakes that you make, I don't think that anything is insurmountable, especially when you're talking about a creative journey, because a creative journey is about mistakes. I mean, it's about, ultimately, it's why you're in school, because school, part of the value of being in school is that it's an environment in which you can safely fail. Um, failure in the real world is much less appealing. Um, and that's why you pay money to go to a university that will teach you, uh, give you the tools to succeed, but also give you a safe environment in which to fail. And that's an absolute essential part of the creative process. Um, so the degree to which you're able to integrate those failures or shortcomings or mistakes, as you put them, um, the better off you'll be. I don't think that any of them hinder uh, forever. You know, they may be setbacks but they're not game changers, mistakes anyway. I'm gonna cut in just for a second. I've got, we have a question that came in uh, over our Twitter feed, and this is from Jamie, and the question At is- At Nelson, tell us what it is. Oh, right, I will. Um, do you guys have any uh, information, sneak peeks, et cetera, that you can share about the chair project? At Chris Moore. <laughs> um, sent that text, sent that question in. Um, well, we're, we're thrilled, you know, we're, we're in production now, or they are in production, I should say. Neil, Neil and I serve uh, as executive producers, so everybody knows the difference between producer and executive producer, yes? For the most part, I imagine, it's film school. Um, so an executive producer, and it's different in television and film, actually. In television, an executive producer is sort of the more... Um, it's the higher rank, for lack of a better word, but in, uh, in film, an executive producer, um, you know, our company is the company that is, uh, you know, we, that's the entity that is involved that we represent. Um, and as executive producers, we oversee from afar. We're not on set every day, obviously. Uh, you know, we're both Neil's knee deep in a most violent year, and uh, I'm still finishing a play in New York. And so we're here to kind of check in, and we're available to the filmmakers. We're available to people that might have questions or things that come up. But, you know, we're really a, a support structure from afar, and, and we really see that role as doing what we can to support the director, you know, being, being there to, to, to allow them to tell the story that, that they want to tell and making sure that we're doing everything we can to give them that environment. And a producer is the person who's doing that same thing basically but every day, um, you know, on set. So, um, and in this case, the experiment of the chair, Chris, they know what the experiment is. Chris isn't here, but Chris, they know the experiment. They do. So the, the experiment of the chair and Chris himself are the reasons why we decided to get involved. It was really exciting to us. It's a pretty rare opportunity for us to be involved in a project that has, frankly, the creative side of it, to go back to what we're here to talk about, um, at its forefront. So it's less a business model than it is a creative model. That's not to say that the plan isn't for it to be successful on a business basis as well. But the idea of two directors being given the same raw materials um, script and amount of money and city and the resources of this city, um, particularly a city that we love so much, is a really amazing experiment. And the idea to get to see that play out both personally as we watch it play out, but also um, as part of the documentary that's being made about the making of the two movies and as part of the product, which is ultimately where it's, the experiment's gonna be most fascinating in certain ways, is when you see the product of what two different directors did. Um, it's a testament to what a director's vision brings to a film. Um, they're gonna be really different. <laughs> that, that, is that a, that's, a, that's a tease we can say. These two directors got the same script, the same dollar amount, and the same city, 
and they're going to be very, very different movies. And, and from that material, we're allowed to do a draft uh, of their own. Um, and one of the directors chose to work really closely with the writer of the original material, and the other director chose to work more independently on the draft. So the results were two enormously different scripts. And you know, I, I, I was intrigued by the idea of the chair when Chris first presented it to us, just based on the fact that it was what Neil laid out for you, you know, two directors basically directing the same film. But when I read each of the filmmakers' drafts, uh, it, it became infinitely more exciting to me because I was staggered at how different they were. And that, for me, makes uh, the idea soar. You know, it's not just two people kind of doing the same thing and kind of just, you know, putting their spin on it. It's two people that couldn't be more diametrically opposed in what their interpretation of the material is. Um, and I think that probably without really knowing how successful that formula would be, um, these two filmmakers, Shane Dawson and Anna Martimucci, really proved Chris's point that this is a, an, an incredibly intriguing formula um, that'll allow audiences to see um, exactly the impact that the creative process has on making a movie. Um, and, and how singular one person's voice can really be. Because I think um, there's an idea, which you guys all probably face sometimes when you go home and talk to your aunts and uncles at like Thanksgiving, where like a director, oh, so you just, you tell the actors how to say their lines and you point the camera that way. It's sort of the simplified version of what a director does, right? And it's, you know, obviously a million things in addition to those two things. Um, and I think this sort of exposes those in like, a really stark way, you know, it's a little like the butterfly effect in a weird way. It's mm -hmm. like that notion that like you sliding change. Sliding doors. Sliding doors. We can come up with other come references, on. I'm sure. Um, one. New Broadway musical, If Then. It's opening. Is that that same idea? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the idea that every little decision has ripple effects that go throughout. Well, the, as by way of anecdote, the movie that I'm working on right now, um, which now, you know, that's little more money, um, I joke with JC, our director, a lot that when he sort of thinks something, it starts to happen, like over in a corner. Um, and it's kind of true. Um, we found it happening every now and again where, where he'll be saying to someone sort of casually, you know, it would be interesting if that truck was blue. And suddenly you'll see a guy sort of walking across a room with a blue paintbrush ready to go make that truck blue. But and that's just like a little example, but that's, those are the kind of decisions that a director is involved in making, and the way that they vastly change something um, is, is made very clear by the, by the experiment that Chris has managed and, to figure out how to set up. And that's the thing that's exciting about it, because the script is ultimately the foundation, so the fact that each of these filmmakers got to work on the script and create the material the from which they would on, on which they would then build the rest of the story is amazing because it's that point at which all the other decisions fall into place. And it's that point at which um, the, the differences in their personalities and their creative visions really, um, really come to, to bear. Thank you, Twitter. Right here. Uh, hi, I'm a freshman acting student. Uh, my question's mainly towards Zach, but I'd love to hear from both of you. It's okay, you can just talk to the famous guy. <laughs> Um, do you still get intimidated whenever you walk onto a film set or stage the first time? And what were some of your guys' biggest challenges when you work from, when you go from behind the scenes to in front of the camera? That's a good one. You hate the value talk. What? The value talk. What do you mean? Do you oh, mean? oh that about behind yeah. the camera, in front of the camera. Well, uh, yeah, so that's a couple parts. First of all, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I get intimidated before I get on set, actually. But being on set is... Um, it's an environment that I'm pretty familiar with now, so, so it's not the actual being on set, it's the anticipation of being on set, that, that you know, I'm about to start a movie in, in a week, and, uh, and, and now's the time, the week before I start is the time when I'm sort of like, okay, going through these checklists of things that I need to accomplish, or things that I need, questions I need to answer, things that I need to come up with, decisions I need to make that I haven't made yet, and I need to read it again, and I need to hurry up, and I, now I know what I'm gonna be wearing, so what is the, you know, I mean, all of those things and the anxiety can build in that way, but when you're on set, and actually part of now that, I've, now that I'm a little more you know, settled in my process, one of the things that can really help is when I'm spinning in, in that place of, 
uh, going through the, that mental checklist, I can remind myself that being on set is very manageable. Even on a 175 or 200 million dollar movie like the Star Trek films, like when you're on set, you have a certain number of pages you have to shoot a day. So my responsibility is to learn my lines, to make choices about where the character is in that particular scene, to make sure that I'm tracking the journey because as you well know, you never shoot chronologically. So making sure I understand where that, that character is emotionally, where he is physically, um, those are the things that, that become the daily, um, the daily reminders and the things that are important on a day-to-day -day basis and those are the things that can help calm an anxious mind in anticipation of getting there. So it's not really being on set that intimidates me. Um, I, I quite enjoy being on set and, uh, and working. Um, and yeah, I mean, behind the camera versus in front of the camera, it was a great world for me to be a margin call because I felt like I had the best of both worlds. I felt like, you know, I was producing this film pretty actively. I mean, I was involved much more in margin call than I was with any of the other things that we produced on a daily basis because I was there for work, you know, and when I wasn't, I would go by and it felt like I was surrounded by people, Corey and Neil, who I trust implicitly and who made sure that I had all of the necessary um, resources to do my work as an actor, but that between takes I could go into the office and have a conversation about you know, where we were in our day or what trouble we were having with the sound department or whatever else it might have been that I could contribute Sound department to. was an issue. For me personally, which I could contribute <laughs> to then and, and be involved with. You know, whereas uh, All Is Lost, Banshee Chapter, Breakup at a Wedding I was more involved with, but, but Banshee Chapter and All Is Lost and now Most Violent Year, I'm doing other stuff as an actor that is not related to the company, so I'm, you know, I'm checking in on the phone and seeing dailies at the airport this morning and being really proud of my producing partner who's on the ground making it happen, and you know, I'm, I'm contributing to and benefiting from it in other ways. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Um, I almost don't want to ask my question now because I'm a freshman cinema major and I'm a sound concentration. Oh, no, no. No, that's <laughs> good. If you're a sound, concentrate um, on that sound. That's good. <laughs> um, my question basically, even though I'm a freshman, I'm already thinking fast forward to my future and about getting my foot in the door and getting started. And I kind of was going to ask you to speak for your um, sound crew, for your production company and any films, that if they've worked on all of the films from them or just separate ones, but what do you think it would take for me to get started early in the future? Like, I, I obviously know networking and working on as many sets as I possibly can, but what do you, is there any special trick I should keep in mind for my future? Ultimately, you know, a lot of the hiring stuff comes out of, um, doesn't come out of our job. We sort of are sometimes tasked with picking between the final two people that are recommended to us by a line producer by UPM who are really in charge of putting the crew together. Um, we haven't worked with the same people over and over. That's not true. We actually, someone who worked on Breakup at a Wedding with us, we had a great experience with them because they were very get up and go and it was a tiny little movie. So it was a half a million dollar movie that we were making in New York City and they killed it. They did an amazing job. And consequently, I brought them to Mexico uh, to go work on the $9 million movie in Baja. So it's actually not true. We, we, those, the, and they got nominated for a BAFTA for following Robert Redford around in a boat. And, um, and they did a great job. And they were up in waist deep water. So I, I, I guess the answer is the, where that guy got his start and why he got so good and why when we worked with him, he was so good was he had worked on Lena Dunham's Tiny Furniture, which was, in essence, a tiny, tiny, it's OK. Do you like that movie? She's awesome. <laughs> I agree. Zach knows her a little bit, so you should talk to him afterwards. And just, <laughs> it's all about the, as he was saying, it's all about the connections and using them to get what you need, you know? <laughs> I'm just messing with him. Don't talk to him about that. Yeah, <laughs> that'll be awkward. Um, but uh, but uh, the, the, the end of that, I'm on a little, I'm on a little thing here. I don't I'm know. you go. Um, I'm just going to run with it. <laughs> uh, the answer is work really hard. I don't know. Um, people get hired because people like you. They do. Um, I would much rather work with someone who, I'm not going to hire someone who's really nice and is terrible at their job, but if they're like okay at their job, but they're awesome to hang out with and they bring the right energy to set, we'll totally hire people. Um, so keep that uh, about you. Um, and that's true to the biggest movies I know of. You know, The guys that are working on the movie that we're making right now are <clears throat> the Coen brothers gaffer and the Coen brothers grip. 
Why are we working with them? Because they read this script and decided they didn't need to be paid what they get paid when they work with Ridley Scott and these other big guys. They really cared about the material. They showed up and every day when I walk into the set, instead of grumbling because they're not getting paid as much as they get paid in the other movies, they say, hey, how are you today? It's really good to see you and we had a great day yesterday. Can't wait to get into it. And that means the wor these are guys that I'm a fan of their work, right? But they, they care and they're showing up for the right reasons. And sometimes the right reason isn't money. Sometimes it is. Um, so, I don't know, that's sort of a smattering of decent to mid-level advice. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Good, thanks. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm a junior that's mostly concentrating in screenwriting, actually, and one of my biggest questions is what, is, what are some of the components that you guys find really important before taking a script from a production standpoint? Well, I think Neil and I would probably have uh, similar answers, but different because we care about different things. Uh, you know, I'll bring, I'll, bring, <laughs> I'll bring ideas to Neil all the time. <laughs> this is a great idea, right? No, it's not a great idea. Where's the audience for that movie? Where, you know, where are we going to shoot that? So, so Neil, and as we work more, Neil's, um, Neil's parameters, I think, are, hon are sharpening, you know, and all of ours are. Um, I would say the similarities in our answers would be we like... Um, projects that are socially relevant to some degree. Um, we like projects that are innovative on some level, whether it's creatively and in, in the way the story is told. It's an innovative story to have one man on a boat with no dialogue in a movie. That's not something that you see very often. Um, in the case of Banshee Chapter, uh, Blair Erickson, who directed that film, had a lot of innovative ideas with regard to 3D technology that, that we thought were interesting. So it's the technique in which the film is made is innovative. So innovation is something that we look for. Um, relatability, um, but also not taking audience for granted is something that's really important to us, making sure that we draw an audience in and ask something of the audience. We don't have to answer the questions that the, that the screenplay might raise for an audience, but we have to present them in a way that doesn't alienate the audience, that doesn't, um, that doesn't uh, take them for granted, as I said, and, and, and that doesn't let them off the hook as well. Um, and to the point that he was saying about the notion that I am the one who shoots down all his good ideas, um, the, the, the way that I would define that for myself, which is something, again, I, we've learned over the course of the last five years, certainly don't claim to be experts on it. We've only made a couple movies. Chris has made a shit ton more movies than we have. Um, but that being said, um, I think there's the right you can, I would never discourage anyone from writing any story that they really felt that they wanted to write. However, I would say there's a right price for every movie. And there are some movies for which there is no right price. And this is what I mean by that. So if you write Margin Call and you don't have a lot of stars in it, and it's basically an adult drama, which is code word for middle-aged people go see it, young kids don't go that much unless they're film students and... Um, men go more than women and it's not gonna ever make $100 million, right? Then you can't go spend $100 million making that movie, right? So for any movie that you write, there's sort of a right market and a right price. And if you're trying to make a $100 million movie about a pedophile, <laughs> you, you could try. But my guess is there's no audience to support that movie. Thus, finding cast who's willing to do it, finding financing for that, finding distribution for that movie is going to be really tough, right? But if you want to make that movie for, I don't know what the right price is for the pedophile movie, but there's probably a price. Um, and you think it's a great piece of, but, but to, to follow that through, Happiness is a great movie by Todd Solons. If you've ever seen it, it's actually about a pedophile. That movie was not made for $100 million. It wasn't made for $10 million. My guess is, Chris, what do you think Christine made that movie for? under a million bucks, right? So, so that's, that's a movie that actually tells an amazing story about that challenging subject matter. It was a profitable film-ish, but no one was angry at the end, I don't think, holding a bag of empty, you know, an empty bag waiting for money to be put in it. it was, a bag it of was empty money? A bag of empty money. Um, that might be every bag of money, I don't Does know. Does anyone have a bag of empty money? I yes, because <laughs> we'll take it. Um, but yeah, so I, the, for me, that's the answer is, is making sure that the scope and scale of your project, the subject matter of your project, and the audience of your project, and that's not me being like a pessimistic Hollywood producer no. guy, it's just you're gonna bang your head against the wall. And it is really helpful actually when I have those conversations with Neil because it helps me understand you know, the, the, the direction in which we want to take our company and, and that's a factor in it, you know, creative we, versus commercial. We, we, we have a little mini mantra we say, we try and make it for less, it's, less than it's worth. 
like that that's sort of like a good way to go about it. So if you think it's worth 10 million bucks, make it for nine and you'll probably be okay at the end and they'll probably let you do it again, even if it stinks. So. Thank you. Good luck. Thank good you. Good luck, yeah. <laughs> good luck. Hey guys, um, kind of a broad question, but I'm just curious. Um, where do you see um, film as an art form going in the future? Um, that's not broad. <laughs> Well, look, I mean, I think that uh, accessibility has increased infinitely in the past 10 years. Technology uh, in and of itself has, has leveled the playing field in so many ways. You making know, and watching. We, yeah, making and watching. Where the platforms on which people are getting their creative content have changed and become much more immediate. Um, but so has the process of making films. I and mean, we have people that we know personally who have made really good films for $15,000, you know, feature length films, utilizing resources that they have and equipment that they have and people who are willing to contribute and volunteer their time. And I think in a lot of ways, that's a blessing and a curse. I mean, I think obviously it makes it easier for people to tell their stories. Um, the downside is that it floods the market with content and it becomes di more difficult for you to get your voice heard. Um, you know, people who are less concerned with integrity and more concerned with exposure or fame or the celebrity side of it, um, you know, kind of clog up the creative conduits for other people. Um, but, but that's the nature of the, the world we live in and something that we all have to evolve with and adjust to. Um, but I, I, I don't mean I'd say that it's going to continue in that vein, which is that there's going to be more outlets for the content and more ways to make content. And um, to the extent that it gives you all more opportunity, then that's awesome. But to the extent that it requires more of you creatively, you have to be prepared to step up and be, be willing to have a clear and, and articulated vision about what you want to make and why you want to make it. Because that question is going to be much more important as I think time goes on. Why, what, what are you making and why are you making it? What is your voice? What do you have to say? I mean, I'm, I'm personally really interested in directing and writing and all of the other you know, aspects that go along with storytelling and filmmaking. The thing that stops me is I don't know what I want to say yet. When I know what I want to say, I don't think anything can stop me. But I don't have that yet for myself. Um, and I'm a lot older than most of you guys. So I feel like the, the more you can cultivate that, I mean, I've been on a different path. You guys are obviously on that path to answer that question now. Um, so answer it, you know, what do you want to say? Why do you want to say it? And then you begin the journey of how to say it. And that I think becomes easier if you can answer those first two parts of the question. Amen. Thank you. I'm just going to cut in just because we only have about five to seven minutes left. Yes. Because you guys have some additional obligations that you need to get to. Mm -hmm. um, so either two things will happen. We'll answer two more questions and that'll run us up to five. Or you answer really quickly, and we can get to all the people standing up. Let's do that. Rapid Everybody's fire. been Let's standing there. Let's go. All right. Go. Hi, I'm a screenwriting major, and I, they kind of go hand in hand. But where do you think the industry is going story-wise and how your company fits in with it? A lot more television, a lot longer story arcs for filmmaker -y kind of stories, smaller character-driven stuff. Big tent poles are always going to be made until somebody loses way too much money on them, at which point they're going to stop making quite so many of those. Um, and for us, we're looking to start telling some television stories in the cable arena um, that we haven't quite figured out what they are yet, but we have a couple ideas. And other than that, we're going to keep trying to make filmmaker-driven, character-driven, um, socially relevant sort of movies. And obviously, we'd be crazy to stop making movies with JC because they've been very successful for us. The same goes for the other directors that we've worked with. And uh, the chair. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I am a junior um, production um, concentration, but so I what does it does that mean? To you want to be a producer, or you want to? Yeah, I kind of want to be kind of like Shauna Rhimes, like write my own shows and. You want to be a showrunner? Kind of. Great. Um, pretty much. But what's right your now, name? I'm Matt. Matt. I'm, I, I tend to be more like Melrose Place, like those kind of I was going to try to make a joke about Shondaland, but it doesn't really work with Matt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Matt. I tend to be more like Melrose Place, like that kind of soapy drama, but right now I'm working on like a horror franchise of movies, and it kind of goes to both of you because you've produced a movie and you obviously have been on American Horror Story. So to redefine the way a franchise of horror films would be, what would you suggest focusing on? 
Should, should just, what was your last word? Focusing on. Focusing yeah, on. What would you focus on to redefine the way the, the franchise is done instead of like constant serial killer that comes back from the dead? Like, yeah, I mean, listen, I'm, and I think the, the answer is sort of you have to, you're the only one who can answer that question. If you think about the people who have done what you're talking about doing, um, you know, Robert Kirkman wrote a really long zombie story instead of a really short one that ended in two hours and consequently you have one of the most successful cable television shows of all time in your, the genre that you're talking about, right? Ryan Murphy that Zach worked with um, created a series that was an anthology, which seemed like a great way to get out of having to tell a really long story and be able to say, you know what, let's set it in a, here for a little while or here for a year or here for a year. Um, those Wes are their Craven, innovations. Wes that... Craven figured out a way to poke fun at his own movies and turn that back around on himself, right? And reinvented the whole slew of movies that he'd made originally and moved on from there to make a whole you know, another franchise that was sort of meta. So for you, there's going to be an answer to that question yeah. and whether that means in reinventing an existing genre, creating one of your own um, or otherwise, um, you know. And that's a good example of like, you know, that, that, that's a prime example actually of the way in which you guys need to step up and figure out where things are going. You know, I mean, we're doing that for ourselves in whatever way we can, you know, and, and we have a certain foundation that, that puts us in a certain place to do that. And that's what you're building for and toward. And, and, and so it's interesting, you know, that I would echo Neil and bounce that question back to you. So you can look at the things that inspire you. By the way, you. if we knew, we'd be doing it. <laughs> we wouldn't tell you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Good luck, Matt. Hello. Matt Land. Um, as a Pittsburgh native and as CMU alumni, how does it feel or what is it like to be back in Pittsburgh? you know, after living in Los Angeles and New York, being back here to work on a project? Hungry. hungry. Neil's Food. hungry. Neil needs some permanis. I brothers. need some permanis. I need um, some... I'm hungry. I mean, I, 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 you know, th this is really a fantastic um, part of the experience that I could never have imagined. I mean, um, to be in the place that... There's a parade tomorrow in Zach's honor. Um, no, that's there's not, not true. There's not. That's not true. <laughs> But someone I won't should be work here, on that. So if there is, it's going to be pretty lame. Um, <laughs> but uh, but you know, I feel like that's a, an incredible part, and it's a, a huge incentive for us to come back and you know to share with people who are coming from the same background that we, I came from and that Neil's just a few miles away from is really it's really exciting and um, and humbling in a lot of ways. You know, I'm I'm walking the streets that that I really. Um, spent a lot of time dreaming on and, and hoping that I could do even a fraction of what I've been able to do so far. And so for me, it's really special. And uh, I, when it was yet another added incentive to this whole project that it takes place here and that it's, you know, giving opportunities to students and also to crews and, you know, people were creating jobs in Pittsburgh. I mean, it's, it's, it, it exists on a lot of levels, you know, hometown pride is one of them, but then, you know, really supporting and helping to nurture and or cultivate, which is something that Chris Moore is really a huge champion of, but creating Regional Film Center here in Pittsburgh, which is an, an enormously ripe city for just that. You know, there's, there's incredible... Gesundheit. There's an incredible infrastructure here that can, that's just waiting to be tapped in terms and of... And they don't make movies in Los Angeles talent. anymore at all. Almost at all, even though we generally spend our time living there. Um, so it's, uh, you know, Pittsburgh with a great film credit and, you know, the, the amazing neighborhoods and it's an amazing undershot undershot city so um chris and, and our producing partner corey and the three of us are, are uh, along with chris are really committed to trying to figure this out and if pittsburgh will have us and that means both financially and uh you know infrastructurally mm -hmm. i'm gonna go Good with it you. um uh, I, I was sort of it unrolled as it, uh -huh. as it came out of my mouth um Sustenance. we'd love to come back here yeah we'd love to come back here and make a bunch more movies. I know the same is true for Chris, who shot Promised Land here, and has other projects that he'd like to make here as well. And we've got a bunch, a bunch too. So we're uh, we're psyched about it. We'll be Thank back. You. Well, we'd course. love to have you. Thank Thanks. you. Sorry, this was supposed to be rapid fire. It's okay. We're good, Neil. Just breathe. All right. we're, I see the clock in the back. We're all right. What's up? Hi. Um, so I'm wondering um, what you both would say are the advantages and disadvantages of both the creative side as well as the business side of filmmaking. Okay. Advantage of the creative side. Advantage of the creative side, uh, well, for us, it's that we are a truly an independent company. So we've never really been beholden to people beyond um, a reasonable measure um, and, and beyond what we want to support and nurture creatively. Disadvantage of creative. I'm just money, trying to be organized money, about this like, question. Like, yeah. like, you know, finding the money becomes m more of a challenge and we have to do it every time. And 
the financial side of things, you know, it's like we've, we've by, by any standards, have, have set out and accomplished a lot of the goals we set for ourselves when we started the company six years ago, and yet we're still figuring out how to expand and grow and how to put money into the company and build because it's sort of a, you know, it's like two steps forward, one step back kind of thing, and, and we're working in that regard like still. Paul, like Paul Abdul. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what was the other half? The, oh, uh, the, the business side. The business side. Uh, advantage. I don't, I'm not well, quite the sure. The advantage what that of the means. business, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, look, Neil's putting a lot of pressure on me to answer these questions Do in it. a rapid fire manner, and it's stressing me out. <laughs> um, I would say, like, for me as an actor, <laughs> one of the ways in which I have a really hard time being a producer as well is understanding how actors come to projects. It's probably the most demoralizing part of the filmmaking process, it was so much more demoralizing than you could ever imagine to sit in a room. Um, as a producer and to be talking about a project that we're putting together and to have my friends, you know, who I think are tremendous actors and, you know, really inspire me creatively on so many levels, get not only <laughs> shot down but like torn apart and eviscerated by financiers and I would never work with that person, like I hate that, per that person, Did you, have you seen that person's face? It looks like, I mean like, just crazy, like the way people get talked about and the value that's put on people, it's so like, it's just, it really is distasteful for me, and it's something that I've learned about myself. It's something that, as an actor, I won't be in casting meetings. Until there's a list of 10 actors that have been approved by a, a financier, I will have nothing to do with casting. Once that list is put in front of me, I'll do anything I can to get to those people on that list. But unless it's a project I'm directing, I'm not gonna be in those meetings and, and expose myself to that. But that's something I've learned about myself because I'm not interested in that, you know? It makes me just imagine how people talk about me. So, so, so that's a disadvantage for me, but the advantages are many, I would say. Yeah, we get, we, Zach took me as his date to go sit behind Meryl Streep at the Oscars. That was a pretty big advantage. That was a good advantage, yeah, good advantage. All right, thank you. It's pretty great. Yes. Hey, uh, what's up? I have a very, very, like, probably you get this question a lot. Uh, you know, you make This is going to be for you, Zach. Yes, I, I'm sorry. It's okay. okay. I, I, I could smell it coming a mile away. <laughs> Um, you know, you're in a lot of stuff and people generally know who you are. What's it like to be a celebrity? Like, what's it like for like, a lot of people to know your name? You that know? is a very, very good question. Yeah. It depends on the day, man. I mean, you know, I feel like uh, I, don't, I don't really walk through my life on a moment-to-moment -moment basis thinking about being a celebrity. Um, which is probably part of what's not great about it because I get reminded about it more than I would want to be on my own, you know? I, I try to just be as, you know, I try to live the life that I would live anyway. Um, you know, there are tremendous advantages to it, obviously. Um, I've been incredibly blessed and fortunate and I try not to take any of it for granted and I try to make sure that I treat people with the same respect that I would if I wasn't a celebrity. And I, I think that that balance and that calibration somewhere helps me stay sane, helps me able, be able to connect with people on a genuine level, which I, I always want to have that kind of experience no matter what. And, um, and I get to, 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 to work. I get to do what I love to do. Um, that's enough, that's that enough. Means All questions only through his publicist. <laughs> <laughs> and if that means that I have to take you know, some pictures with people in the airport or something, then uh, it's a small price to pay. But I feel like that's a part of my job. I see it as part of my job and I treat it as part of my job and then I live my life. And those are, those are two separate things that I try to cultivate some peaceful coexistence with. That's awesome. Good cool. luck in Hitman, by the way. Oh, it's Agent 47, but it's based on the Hitman series. Thank you. <laughs> Well, you guys, um, first of all, thank you all for coming out to the afternoon seminar. <laughs> Was there a name for this? Uh, the creative side of filmmaking, building a lasting career. Well, let's hope it lasts. That's all I have to say about that. And for you all, too, good luck with everything legitimately. And uh, thank you so much for having us. And we'll be back. So, peace. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Neil.